Hi, welcome back to Grains and Small Places. If you're new around here, welcome. My name is Kara and my channel is dedicated to fresh milled flour. So I have tips, tricks, tutorials, recipes, all the things. And I also have my blog, grainsandsmallplaces.net, where you can find all of those recipes and lots of those tips and tricks. So have you seen the like TikTok or social media viral recipe, I guess it is, for the cinnamon roll focaccia. Well, I really wanted to take that, but then turn it into fall. So I decided let's turn this into a pumpkin cinnamon roll focaccia made with fresh milled flour. So let's get started. Okay, so first off, I'm gonna make sure that I put a link to this recipe in the description box below because it's gonna have like three parts. We're gonna have the dough, the like topping, and then if the optional icing if you wanna do that. But for the dough, we'll start with that. I'm gonna be using mostly hard white wheat, so like 80%, and then the rest is gonna be kamut. You can use all hard white, you could use hard white, hard red, all hard red, something that has uh, mainly one of the hard wheats because that's how we can get our gluten development, which gives us that nice stretchy dough. And then the Kamu, I really like the flavor it gives. I like the texture it brings to the dough. I just really enjoy that. If you've been watching me for a while, you probably already know that. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and start out with about 80% of the hard white wheat. I like to measure my wheat berries. I got it in ounces. I got to do grams. I like to measure my wheat berries. That way I know exactly how much I'm getting in flour because if this is 460 grams of wheat berries, it should give me 460 grams of milled flour. So let's start out. Let's do like 340 of the hard white. Okay. And then I'll make sure to put um, a link in the description box below for these grain, like everyday grain bins and my mixer, my mill, all the things that way. If you have any questions, you can find those down there. I also have a link to my website, which has all of my recipes that are all based off of fresh milled flour. And then I also will put a link to my Facebook group, which is free that you can go talk with others about if you have any questions or share your bakes, all those fun things. I'll put a link to that as well. And then of course my Instagram channel and all the, all the things. <laughs> so if you want to find me at any of those places, that link should be down below. Okay. So a total of 460 grams. This might be slightly different for you, depending on your environment, where you live, if it's humid, if it's not humid, every time I bake something, it's a little bit different each time. So I'm going to go ahead and take this on over to my mill. I'm using my Nutramill Harvest Grain Mill and I have a coupon code to share with you. That coupon code is grainy and that will get you $20 off any of the mixers or mills and even some of the attachments at the Nutramill website. I'll make sure to put a link to that in the description box below as well. Okay, so while that is milling, you can go ahead and weigh out your other ingredients if you want and then grab your mixer. But I'm gonna go ahead and weigh out, I'm looking for 240 grams of water. That's what we're going to start with. And then I'm kind of playing around with this with the pumpkin. I want to find out the moisture level that I'm going to need. So I'm using kind of a mixture of my focaccia dough and then trying to add in the moisture for the pumpkin. So as you know, I may need to adjust the moisture as we go. So 241 grams, I'll take that. I'm gonna go ahead and just warm this up lightly in the microwave. I don't want it so hot that it's steaming or bubbling. I just want it nice and just a little bit warm. And then we'll go ahead and grab our mixer as well. Okay, I went ahead and grabbed my mixer. We've got the warmed up water. I need to put it in for about a minute or so. And then, and I wanted to update you. I've had my mixer now for about a year and I am just blown away by what this mixer is capable of. I love it. So I wanted to update you. I've had so many people asking me, Hey, you've had this mixer. What, what, what are your thoughts now? So I just wanted to update you on that. Let you know that it is a beast. <laughs> it's a workhorse. So I'm going to do one third a cup of brown sugar. Now you could use honey or maple syrup here if you prefer. This is just to help sweeten the dough because this is going to be more of a dessert focaccia. 
I'm going to use about a cup of the pumpkin puree. Now, don't be concerned. Let me get a spoon, <laughs> actually. Okay, I'm gonna use one of these little mini spatulas. You can use your own homemade pumpkin puree. You can use a can of pumpkin puree, whatever you wanna use, but you just wanna make sure that it's the plain and not seasoned, because we're gonna season that ourselves as we go here. And I will make sure to put in the description box below, I'll put the volume, so the cups and all that, but I'll also put the weight of everything. So whichever baker you are, <laughs> then you should be able to make this recipe. Okay, and then to this, I'm gonna go ahead and put a little bit of this pumpkin spice in the dough itself. Now, if you put too much cinnamon and things like that inside of the dough, that can inhibit your yeast growth because those sorts of things will kill it. So I'm gonna try putting about two teaspoons of the pumpkin spice. If you wanna make your own pumpkin spice blend, that's fine, you can do that as well. I'll put in the description box below, you know, your cinnamon, nutmeg, clove, and ginger. So whichever way you prefer. Okay, and then we're also gonna be doing one and a half teaspoons of salt. And if you saw one of my, I recently updated you on one of my favorite salts. I made a whole video <laughs> on this Baja Gold salt. So it's been my favorite. I do have a 10% um, coupon code I can share with you if you're interested in grabbing some of that. I'll again put that down in the description box below as well. And then I'm just gonna rinse off my measuring spoon because I'm going to use this later to remind me to put the yeast in because we're not gonna put the yeast in right at this moment. And then the last thing we're going to do is about a quarter cup of unsalted butter. If you have salted butter, that's fine. You can just reduce the amount of salt to one teaspoon instead of one and a half and then use salted butter, but I'm gonna use unsalted butter. We're gonna use about a quarter of a cup, which is about four tablespoons or a half of the stick. And then I will make sure to put that in weights in the description box, like I mentioned before. I'm gonna go ahead and melt this a little bit so it mixes in a little better. So I'm just gonna stick that in there and pop that in the microwave real quick. If you don't wanna use a microwave or you prefer to do things on the stovetop, you can warm the water and melt that butter right in together on the stovetop and then pour this in all together. That would be fine as well. Okay, so that's good. It's not completely melted all the way, but we're melted enough. I'm just gonna pop that in there. Oh, wow, that smells amazing. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go ahead and give this a little mix and let me see if I can adjust this a little bit. Okay, maybe that's better. All right, I'm just gonna mix all of these wet ingredients together. And I kind of debated if I should try to put egg in this recipe or not, but I was like, well, this is a focaccia. Focaccia doesn't usually have egg, so if I was making a cinnamon roll, I would add eggs in here and I probably would use some milk. But since this is more of a focaccia style, we're going to go with no egg. And then we're using butter instead of olive oil. You could use olive oil instead, but I really think because this is kind of a dessert focaccia that the butter is gonna add that richness that we need. So let me grab the flour. This is our beautiful fresh milled hard white and kamut. I'm gonna go ahead and just put all of this in Since we know all the measurements and everything, we should be good to go. I'm gonna go ahead and start mixing this in. And again, I'm not exactly sure if we will need to adjust the moisture, but I can always add more water if we need to, or more flour, but I will tell you this, it is very, very rare that you need to add more flour, especially with fresh milled flour, and especially at this stage, because the fresh milled flour takes so much longer to absorb the liquid that even if it looks wet at the beginning, it will end up drying a little bit more as the time goes by. I mean, it continues to absorb that liquid all the way through the first rise, all the way through the shaping and everything. So you don't want to start out with a dry dough. Otherwise, you're going to have a very dry and dense end product. So right now, we're not really needing anything. I have it on my lowest speed here. I just want to get all of the freshly milled flour combined with the liquids here so that it can start hydrating. And then we're going to do an autolyze. So basically it's not technically an autolyze because an autolyze is technically just the flour and water, but I call it that for all intensive purposes. It's easier to explain. 
So I guess you could just call it a soaking or whatever, but I love the color of this dough. So what I'm gonna do is just let this sit for about 15 minutes. So if you have something to do, laundry, errands to run, anything like that, we have not put in the yeast here. So you could always let this sit for, you know, up to two hours. You could even let it sit overnight. Um, I would do that in the fridge. Well, actually it'd probably be fine to sit out because there's no eggs or dairy or anything, but I probably still would put it in the fridge if you were gonna soak it overnight before putting in the yeast. So I'm gonna go ahead and cover this with the handy dandy lid that came with it. We're gonna let this sit for about 15 minutes, at least, like I said, you can let it go longer if you need to, to fit into your schedule. I am putting my spoon here to remind myself that I have not put in the yeast. I like to use the instant yeast just because I find that it works out for my recipes better, my lifestyle better, it rises a bit quicker. I need to use a little bit less of it, but if you're using active dry yeast, this is the time, if you're gonna let it sit for this 15 minutes, that you can go ahead and activate that yeast. So if you have the active dry yeast, you wanna use a little bit of warm water, the yeast for the recipe, and then just a pinch of sugar in there, and then let that sit while this is sitting. It should get nice and foamy by that 10, 15 minute mark. Then when we put our yeast in, that's when you'll dump in the whole mixture. So I wanted to let you know if you're using active dry yeast, that's how you handle that. So we'll be back in about 15 minutes to check on this dough and start the kneading process. Okay, it's been about 15 minutes. So now we're going to go ahead and add in the yeast and start the kneading process. So the kneading process will be a little bit different and be a different amount of time for each person. I'm gonna add two and a quarter teaspoons of yeast. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and turn this on. So as I was saying, the kneading time will be a little bit different for each person, depending on their wheat berries, depending on their environment, depending on their mixer. Everyone's gonna be just a little bit different. We're just looking for nice stretchy dough. So sometimes I do talk about like the window pane and all of that, and that's just a way to describe what the dough feel, feels like. Some people will say it kind of feels like what your earlobe should feel like. That's how you know that it's been kneaded enough to develop the gluten so you have stretchy dough as opposed to dough that's going to make your bread dense. So I'm just on the lowest number here still. Never want to knead your dough on like a fast sp speed regardless of the mixer that you have. One, it's not good for your mixer. Two, it actually will over knead your dough pretty quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and knead this until it looks like nice and stretchy. Anytime you're new or you have a new mixer or you have a new batch of wheat berries, you always want to stay close by because I've noticed that some of my wheat berries that I've used, the, even though they're hard white, even though they're both from the same manufacturer or farm, one batch I used that I had, I had used for several months and it would take 20 minutes to knead. So I just the next time I got a new batch from them, set my timer to 20 minutes, walked away, came back and had over kneaded bread dough. So I had a new batch come in. That batch only took about eight minutes. So it really does vary for your wheat berries. It varies for your environment. It varies for your mixer, all kinds of different variables. So the best way to tell if your bread is done is to just look at your dough, touch your dough and maybe give it a little bit of a stretch. So I'll be back when this is ready to go and I'll show you what it should look like. You can see how that string behind here got stuck and then it pulled it and it let me know that it was really stretchy. It's been going for about, I don't know, 16, 18 minutes or so, but I can tell signs that it's, that was my timer, okay. So I can tell signs that it is developing the gluten. It's nice and stretchy. It's pulled the stuff off the bottom. Let's go ahead and get our hands wet. Anytime you wanna, mess with your dough it's helpful to get your hands wet that way your hands don't stick as bad to the dough but you can see this is nice and stretchy it does still tear a little bit 
So I'm trying to decide. I think I will go ahead and maybe let it go for just a couple more minutes because it just started to get nice and stretchy. I'm going to pull off from what's behind my little scraper there and then I'm just going to go ahead and let this go for a couple more minutes. This dough is feeling nice and soft. It is kind of a wet and sticky dough. As you can see, it's still wanting to stick to my fingers a little bit, even though they're slightly wet. So I'm going to go ahead and let this go. I'm going to put my timer on for about two more minutes. Okay, so that two minutes is up. Let me just pull it to the side here. And I did forget to mention that after the auto lies, when I started mixing, I added about 30 grams extra flour. So let me get my fingers wet. Just because with that pumpkin in there, everybody's like canned pumpkins, a little bit different moisture. So just, I'm going to put, um, like a variation of amount of flour to use for the recipe. So lower or higher, depending on the hydration of your canned pumpkin or homemade pu pumpkin puree or whatever, because I know some's more liquidy than other. So I wanted to let you know that. But here is our nice stretchy dough. I can get just about a window pane, but it's very delicate. As you can see here, it's wanting to tear just a little bit. So I think there's a misconception when people talk about the window pane that it shouldn't tear at all. It is okay if it does have a little bit of a tear when you stretch it, you're really just mainly looking for nice stretchy dough. It doesn't have to be the perfect window pane. Now, when you get that perfect window pane, it's pretty satisfying. I won't lie there, but it doesn't have to be a perfect window pane. Um, it just doesn't happen every single time with every single bake. So just look for that nice stretchy dough. The dough wants to stay together for the most part, and then you're good to go. So normally I would go ahead and cover this and let it rise for an hour, but I think since I have something else I wanna make in here, I'm gonna go ahead and transfer this over to my nine by 13 pan. So let me go ahead and, let's see. My hands are a bit messy, but I think I can do this. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull this out and then make room here and we'll go ahead and get our pan. Let me wash my hands real quick. Okay, and I'm gonna grab my nine by 13 pan. So I was really excited to show this to you because <laughs> you know that I've had that weird, awkward, not quite nine by 13 pan, but I'm excited about this one because it is a pretty um, sturdy. It's not that really thin, cheap metal. There are no coatings, so there's no anti-stick coating on here, which does mean that I need to make sure that I butter this really well, but also it's stainless steel. It's not aluminum, and it doesn't have any of the Teflon coating or anything like that. And then it also came with this stainless steel pan that clips on, or lid, so, and the most amazing thing about the whole thing is it fits in my oven. So I'm very excited to have an actual nine by 13 baking pan. <laughs> so let me go ahead and I'm going to grab a couple tablespoons of just this softened butter that I had. I want to make sure that I butter this really well. And this is focaccia. And as you know, you kind of coat the pan with olive oil pretty heavily when you're making a normal savory focaccia. So I'm going to go ahead and this is about two tablespoons of softened butter. And I've been kind of like really enjoying using butter instead of oil for all of like my cooked and baked goods that grass fed butter is just extremely healthy for you from what i'm reading it has lots of omega threes rather than the omega sixes which from what i understand that's what our bodies are normally lacking You may see me switching over to using more butter than oil, but you do you what's right for your family. Everybody has different preferences and different dietary needs, but I am going to coat this pretty thick because I don't want anything sticking in there. Okay, and while my hands were all nice and buttery, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and grab our dough that we just needed and you can see how it all wants to stay together here it's not like not sticking to my hands now that I have the butter on them okay so I'm gonna go ahead and let this rise in this pan could be a mistake but I'm gonna let this rise in this pan 
for about one to two hours. I want to see it double. So I was hoping to be able to kind of stretch it out here. This dough smells amazing, by the way, if I didn't mention that before. I'm just going to stretch this out into this pan. And then hopefully I'll be able to tell when it's close to double. I'll just have to peek on it in an hour. And if it's double, then carry on. If it's not double, then keep letting it rise. So let me wash my hands real quick. All right, and then we're going to pop the lid on. Now this lid was really sturdy to get on and off because it has this little tab here. By the way, if you're interested in this pan, I will link it down in those links below, like I mentioned before. There we go. Okay, so that's on here. I'm going to go ahead and set this to the side just at room temperature. I'll check on it in an hour and then I'll let you know the next step. So I'm kind of excited. Now, if you're wanting to make this tomorrow, you could always put this in the fridge right now, let it sit in the fridge overnight. And then that gives it that nice long like ferment, not with sourdough, of course, this is yeast, but you get the point. And then you could let it come up to room temperature tomorrow or even the next day. <laughs> Um, for a few hours before you carry on with the next steps. So that's an option as well. I could just put this in the fridge, but I want this today because this smells amazing. So we're gonna go ahead and carry on with it and then check on it once the dough is doubled. Okay, so to make the topping, I'm going to use a stick of butter. Just gonna put this in little pieces here because this has been softening but I'm probably gonna go ahead and also melt this. So you could melt this on your stove top if you prefer to do that or melt it in your microwave. I'm just gonna get it nice and melty. And then after that, I'll put my other ingredients in there. Okay, so that is our stick of butter. That is nice and warm. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in about a half of a cup of brown sugar. And then to that, I'm gonna add two teaspoons of that pumpkin pie spice, or again, you can do all of them individually if you prefer. And then a teaspoon of just cinnamon. And then I'm just gonna stir that together. I like to use that Ceylon cinnamon when I can because of the antioxidants and health benefits. So I threw some of that in there by itself, but I did have the pumpkin spice mix. But again, you can just do the separate cinnamon, nutmeg, clove, ginger, or whatever your favorite blend is of that. So I want this just to be nice and mixed thoroughly. So it's incorporated and all the seasonings are together. And then we are actually going to use half of this after the first rise and then half of it after the second rise. So you can either divide it up by then or just use your best judgment. Can see I spilled a little bit on the table there, but okay. So I'm going to go ahead and set this to the side. Um, if for whatever reason this solids up too much, I can always just warm it back up so that it's nice and liquidy because I want to be able to pour this over our pumpkin focaccia dough. I'm going to actually transfer this over because I think it will be easier to pour. Oh, good, it is big enough. I wasn't sure. <laughs> So this is a microwave safe container so that if I do need to heat this back up for the second use of it, I can. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and set that to the side until it's ready and then I will show you how we go ahead and do half of it and then half of it again. Oh, look how beautiful that is. That smells amazing. Okay, so what I wanna do is this is now just about doubled. It's been like slightly over an hour. I could let it go longer, but I really wanna eat this today. So what I'm gonna do is use half of this mixture that we just made together. I don't want this to be super scalding hot because then that could mess with our yeast production and all of that. So I'm, what I'm gonna do is kind of like use half of this. and drizzle this over half. It's okay if it overflows. I don't have a problem with that. And then 
fold our dough over that. And I was going to see if we could deflate some of this air. Look at that dough. That is just beautiful. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just flip this over and give it a little push in, back into our pan. I'm okay with this. It might melt in my pan and be weird, but that's okay. Pop any air bubbles. And then we're going to let this rise a second time. I'm going to probably let it rise for like 30 to 40 minutes. I want to pop all these little weird air bubbles. Maybe up to an hour. We'll see how it goes. I don't know. We're improvising together here. So I wasn't sure if I wanted to just put all of the mixture on the top. Man, this really wants to do air bubbles here. Sorry. Wasn't sure if I wanted to do all the mixture on the top or if I wanted to try to put a little swirl in here. So we'll see what we get. It may be that we just end up doing this on the top. So I'm gonna go ahead and cover this. We're gonna save that, come back in about 45 minutes probably, and then we'll finish this off. Okay, so it's been about 40 minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and take the rest of this If it's too solid, you can always re-warm this up. But I'm just going to try to drizzle this over the top. Just like you would with olive oil for a regular focaccia. So if you don't want to do the first step where you fold it in half, that's probably fine. Just going to kind of try to evenly spread this out without puncturing too many of the air bubbles. And then we're just going to go in here and do like we normally do with some focaccia. Beautiful. And then I'm going to go ahead and let this actually rise for 30 more minutes before we bake this off. And then I will let you take a look at it after it's been baked. Okay, so it has been rising. It looks absolutely beautiful. I'm going to go ahead and preheat the oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. This is going to bake somewhere between 25, 35 minutes or so. I cannot wait to eat this. So I will bring you back when it's all done being baked and then you can choose to do the optional icing on the top. I think we'll probably go ahead and do it for those who want it and those who don't want it, then we don't need to do it. So you can make that decision if you want to put the icing on the top or not. So I will be back. Okay, so we're gonna make that icing drizzle. I'm going to take about a cup of powdered sugar and about a teaspoon of some vanilla and about a tablespoon of some whole milk. You can use heavy cream as well. And we'll start with that and see what texture we get. We may need to add a little bit more milk. We want this to drizzle but not be completely runny like a glaze. This is gonna be like more of a sort of an icing, I guess, but a drizzled icing. <laughs> but it looks like we might need some more milk in there. Yeah, just a little goes a long way. If you accidentally pour a little bit too much in there, you can always add a little bit more of the powdered sugar. And then you may end up with a little extra or, you know, <laughs> more drizzle. So that's a nice drizzled texture. So I think I'm good with that. 
And then that's ready to just drizzle over the top. You can either drizzle it over the top of the whole thing or each individual piece, whichever you prefer. Okay, and here it is. It was getting a little bit dark towards the end, so I did end up putting this lid on to finish baking so you could use foil as well but i mean it did a great job i just didn't get it on there right away so mine only took about 20 minutes i probably could have pulled it out one or two minutes prior but i wasn't paying attention of it so <laughs> just keep an eye on it i also recommend putting it a little bit lower in your oven but i will let this cool for like at least five or ten minutes in the pan before we try to take it out and then drizzle it with the icing we're just going to take this and just drizzle it all over the top. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today while we made this pumpkin cinnamon roll focaccia with fresh mold flour and it was delicious. So don't forget to check out my blog at grainsandsmallplaces.net where you can find this recipe and a whole bunch of other recipes all dedicated to fresh mold flour. So thanks for stopping by Grains and Small Places. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.